For most of my life I've been studying a subject called bushcraft. The practical knowledge of the natural world we can carry with us in our minds and muscles. But it's about much more than just survival. Bushcraft is a treasure trove of wisdom that enables us to feel a real kinship with the landscape. In this series, I'll explore the world of bushcraft, starting with their own archaeological past, when hunter-gatherers lived in Aboriginal Britain. Our Aboriginal roots are only revealed in glimpses. My journey begins amongst these 6,000-year-old tree stumps which have recently emerged from the mud here on the banks of the Thames in London. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm walking through an ancient forest. Of course, it doesn't look much like one now, but it's incredible. When you look closely, you can start to pick out individual species. This looks like you. And back there there's an oak tree but I have spotted one other thing that's a real gem have a look at this that there that believe it or not is a hazelnut isn't that incredible so I've seen three species here that I can recognize oak yew and hazel and of course because I'm very familiar with those woods in my mind's eye I can put back the leaves the forest and I can even see the flowers that would have grown here. When these trees stood, the Ice Age had passed, but Stonehenge was yet to be built. The Stone Age people who walked these banks were nomadic hunter-gatherers, whose lives revolved around bushcraft. It might all seem like ancient history, but what's incredible is that bushcraft skills were still common knowledge just a few generations ago and were practiced on this very same shoreline. At the turn of the 20th century, people were still fishing on the Thames using hawthorns as fish hooks. And what's really clever is the way they attach the hawthorn to the line. The first thing you do is to put the barb through the end eye of that loop and then open it up one lay and push it through again so that it just sits without any knot to hold it in place just like that and then what happens when a fish takes this when it's baited and goes down into its mouth like that it toggles and holds the fish fast at least that's the theory you need to bait a series of hooks making sure the thorn is pushed through. These hooks on their short lines hang from a stronger line and when it's pegged out at low tide, the idea is we're going to catch flounder. This long line fishing relies on the ebb and flow of the tides and unlike so much of modern life, it can't be rushed. if we got anything. Ah, there we go. One flounder. Excellent. Another one here, look. And we've got another one. 
Oh, I wasn't impressed with that. I'd have been happy with just one fish on the line, but three, that's a result. What interests me though, is the thought that at the turn of the 20th century, there are still people here on the Thames catching fish with just a thorn. But surviving examples of British bushcraft are the exception. To really understand our Aboriginal past, you've got to imagine a time when trees still stood on these banks. In fact, when forest covered the whole of Britain. The canopy was like a jungle, broken only by river courses. We would recognize the trees, but they were massive, far bigger than any alive today. Just a few thousand people living in small bands shared this land with wolves and bear, hunting elk, wild cattle and deer. Our ancestors camped in improvised shelters or caves, moving with the seasons, a lifestyle some communities around the world still practice. One of the real joys of learning bushcraft, particularly in foreign lands, is that you learn to see the landscape around you through the eyes of the indigenous locals. And that transforms your view of your surroundings. The sky really does become your ceiling and the ground your carpet. In Britain, it's archaeology that provides us that opportunity to give us a new view of our homeland. From Aboriginal Britain, there are no faces no voices to help me understand our ancient way of life. Instead, we have only archaeological fragments found in the dirt. But what I love is to use what I've learned from my experiences to fill in the gaps between these fragments of evidence. The knowledge of bushcraft can bring our silent past alive anew. When I walk through a piece of beautiful woodland like this, I try to imagine scenes from the past. Perhaps if I was standing here 6,000 years ago, I might just hear the sound of some excited voices in the distance, the smell of a slow fire drifting through on the breeze. And if I went carefully over to the encampment, I might witness a new child being born into the world, one of our ancestors. Born into a world where plants were of the greatest significance. And the first plant that child would have encountered would have been in the hands of the midwife. And it would have been this plant here. Sphagnum moss, used to wipe the birthing from the child. This is an incredible plant. Almost wherever this occurs, it's being used for the same purposes. It's absorbent, so it can be used as a field dressing, and it has a mild antiseptic quality. But it's also been used as sanitary towels and as nappies, and also as a bubble wrap, if you like, to wrap things that are precious, from children to flint axes. It was stone that shaped our Aboriginal past, a material people had worked for over 500,000 years, while metal's only been used for 5,000. So when you stop to think about it, it's not surprising they developed a highly sophisticated stone tool culture. For me, John Lord is the best flint knapper in the country. His understanding and experience allow him to appreciate the skills of our forebears. These people were incredible craftsmen. We think we know the techniques, but it's the acquiring the skill and putting these techniques into practice perfectly, which takes the doing. Sometimes when you're working on stone and you get a problem, uh, these problems aren't new. These problems were there in the past. And when you do get a problem with it, you are concentrating 100%. You forget all else, so just at that small point, you can actually sort of link minds with people from the past. As the demand for flint intensified, it led to the first industrial landscape of Britain. 
This weird series of pitted hollows is known as Grimes Graves, but the key to its mysterious surface lies underground. Ancient miners dug shafts and side channels through the chalk with antler picks to excavate their precious flint. These nodules formed a seam 12 metres down, and tools made from these mines have been found as far away as Scotland. As archaeologists have uncovered both crude and magnificent stone tools, many have ended up here, in the vaults of the British Museum. One of the things that's really fascinating about bushcraft is the view it gives us of our ancestors. If we were to see that in a museum, we'd, we'd read the label, 350,000 years old, and we'd see its shape. But once we start to learn how to work this material, we see it completely differently. Now we look carefully at it and see how its manufacturer solved problems. It gives us an insight into their mind. And of course, human evolution is mirrored in the development of flint working techniques. By 6,000 years ago, things were a lot more sophisticated. Now we've got these broad, thin tools made for very specialist purposes, a whole range of different tools to do different jobs. This is a discoidal knife, flaked on one edge, polished on the other, a beautiful tool. Again, our understanding of these tools helps us to see into the past, to understand the mindset of the people who made these things and really perceive their world in a completely different manner. It's like travelling in time. And other drawers hold further clues to the diversity of our Aboriginal culture. You can see by the picture what that's what all about. That? That's amazing. Look at that. You see the fish coming up through the it's, water? It's a fish, isn't it? Yeah. With a, with a hook in its mouth. And on a line. And of course that's extraordinary for us because we don't have any line or, or string or rope preserved. So to actually have a little drawing on a, on a fish hook. That is remarkable and it's beautifully executed. So and how, how old is that? That's about 12,500 years. So it's right at the end of the last ice age. And uh, these lovely little needles are from the same site as these fish hooks. And it's so, so thin. Yes. I mean, looking at it that way, you can see how fragile the eye, eye is. Yeah, but just the right size to be threaded with sinew. Yes. Do you find many of these that are broken? Lots of broken ones, but very often in, they turn up in sites in vast numbers. You get eight or nine hundred needles, which really emphasises how important this piece of kit was. This comes from the site of Star Car in Yorkshire about 8,000 years ago. 8,000 years ago. This is, well, I'm sure you know what it is, it's a piece of bracket fungus. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. This is an incredibly useful material. This is one of the most useful materials in bushcraft and use that to make a very good tinder which will catch a spark. Mm. The type of spark that people who lived in a world without metal mm. were able to make. Mm. I've always thought of you as the keeper of the crown jewels because <laughs> from my perspective I think these things are more fascinating than any baubles the royal family wears. But clearly we are just glimpsing how, our, how the world of our ancestors mm. was. How sophisticated do you think they were? From my point of view, I think they're, they're very sophisticated. We must remember that all the things that we've looked at were made by fully modern people, people like us. And certainly by the end of the last Ice Age, people have really got it sussed. Their bushcraft is not simply eking out a living on the edge. These people are surviving with forests full of opportunity, and they make use of it all and uh, they have clearly have a spiritual life and an artistic life which we only get glimpses of through the archaeology but it's as every bit as sophisticated as what we know in the present time from many different communities and even from our own way of life. But not all artifacts are so beautiful. Some of the most intriguing are the ones with imperfections. 
The Ashcott Heath bow, made over 4,700 years ago, is one of Britain's oldest, but the half fragment raises a whole host of questions for the country's top bow maker. Now this, in some respects, is very, very similar to what we know of today as, as a longbow. They've used the most wildest, awful timber from a very, very badly selected tree, in my opinion. The worst choice of wood that I would take to make a bow, because of the small knots and pins, any knots or defects could tear the bow apart. Uh, but the workmanship, again, is still good, even on this. And bearing in mind they were using stone tools. Normally, in wooden bow making, the actual back face of the bow is formed by the outer part of the tree, which on a yew tree is a thin white band of sapwood, which is very, very elastic. So it, it's a sort of a safety feature of, of bow making that we've known about for many, many years. But in this instance, they've actually removed the sapwood completely, and we've got a solid piece of the heartwood of a yew tree. If we want to understand how this weapon was made and whether it ever worked, Chris and I will have to recreate this bow, but leaving our modern tools and workshop behind. Well, Chris, this is, uh, this is the kind of technology that was used in the period of the Ashcott Heath. I mean, they didn't have any metal at all. All of their tools were made of flint. It was a very wide-ranging toolkit, really, quite specialised. This blade is very sharp. You could use that like a draw knife, you know, you could pull it down the wood yep. like this. But I think the key tools are the ones we've got here, these adzes. These, these tools are used very much like this in the hand here. And they are surprisingly effective. It's the, I think the secret is to get the taper right from the tip and then work it further up. With my knowledge of flint tools and Chris's bow making skills, we should make the perfect combination. But it does give you quite, quite nice refined trim. I need to, uh, you need to get the feel yeah, of the, the angle of the... Uh, but you can't test a bow without arrows, so I've got to gather the materials to make these arrowheads fly. One of the key things I'm going to need is some glue to attach the arrowhead to the shaft, and for that the best answer is pine resin. What I'm looking for are these dry areas here. That looks just like wood, but actually what I've got here is hardened resin. I'll take this stone tool, and I just get that. You see there? You see that's resin, powdery resin. Absolutely perfect for my needs. There's something really satisfying about this Stone Age technology. It's tremendously levelling. It, it, it's a grounding force. It reminds you of where we all came from. And uh, some of these resources are just marvellous. The smell of this stuff is fantastic. Oh, wonderful. And for the arrow shafts, hazel. What I'm looking for is a nice straight piece, roughly the right diameter to begin with. I'll just tear it off like that. This is how I've seen arrows collected in Africa. Just very simple, straightforward. Another nice one there. coming on a tree, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard work, but we've, we've got it's quite a way down the process. I'm working on the back face of the bow, and while she was away, I brought the shave. <laughs> I've been using that to reduce the layers on the back of the bow and take quite a bit of wood off, actually. It's yeah. a very, very good tool. Good tool, isn't it? I've never used a tool like that in my life in, in stone, so I was quite impressed with what you can do with it. And these tools, they're, they're much slower than metal, aren't they? Oh, you need more calories to use them, definitely. Yeah. Before I can get on with the arrows, I have to get a fire going, the Stone Age way, using a kit dating back 8,000 years. The key item was this here. This is iron pyrites, and from this, with their flint, they could strike small dull red sparks with which they could start their fire. Their tinder was made from horse's hoof fungus, the same species I'd seen in the British Museum. Because the sparks we get from the iron pyrites are so cool, the tinder has to be very carefully prepared. And to do that, take a flint blade like this and scrape the tinder until you get like a mass of 
them more like fibres. The next job is to strike the spark onto the tinder and this isn't easy and the sparks are very small and very few and far between so it takes normally a few minutes. Normally when I make fire it's straightforward, but this is different. It takes some perseverance. Of course, eventually one lands in the right place and the tinder catches light like this. Take a, another piece of this fungus, which I will ignite now from this little piece here. Just blow on that. Burns very hot. And I put that in there while I can just, just about hold it, it's getting very hot now. And now One of the key things about primitive uh, arrows is accuracy. And accuracy is very much a function of straightness. And that doesn't look too bad, but actually when you look down it you can see it's all higgledy-piggledy waves all over the shop. And the process is to heat the arrow shaft over the fire and then to straighten out the areas where it's bent. This one was just the same as the last one a few minutes ago and gradually now I'm starting to straighten it out. And then once it's straight, I want to dry these stems off and then I can scrape them down a little bit more and then sand them. It's a lot of work, but well worth it. Sitting here getting to grips with these Stone Age techniques makes me realise how resourceful our ancestors were. The forest was both their DIY store and their supermarket. This little plant down here is celandine. And this, strangely enough, is a plant that we do know from the archaeological record was used for food by our ancestors. And it's an easy plant to dig up, which is its great advantage. And uh, that's the bit we eat, that little root there. Doesn't look like very much, but when you consider how easy it is to collect a whole load of them, it makes a good food. And I thought while well, Chris was looking a little tired there working with those stone tools, maybe he'd like to try a snack from the Stone Age. Ah. And you bake them in a scrape under the fire for a few minutes. That should be long enough, I reckon. Break some of this out. What I've done is I've cooked these roots in the ash, and the ash helps to exclude oxygen, and helps to prevent them from burning. Have a quick look. They must be cooked because these are members of the buttercup family, which are poisonous if they're eaten raw. There we go. When they're cooked, you can peel them really easily, and you can see there they're full of starch, that white centre. Soft and delicious. And it tastes a bit like sweet potato. Very, very nice. Grubs up, Chris. These roots, Chris, are a seasonal delicacy. And if the original bowyer who made the Ashcott Heath bow had been making them at this time of year, this might well have been what he ate to keep his energy going while he was building it. Just straight in. I can, skin. That. I can eat the skin as well. What do you reckon? Yeah, potato. Mm. Yeah. And quarter. Yeah. Yeah. Mind you, eat all your roots. <laughs> Get 
bit of sandstone, a piece of leather, and um, this is our uh, abrasive paper. What do you reckon? Yeah, that's fantastic, smooth. I could probably use the same process on the bar. Oh, I thought you might say <laughs> that. <laughs> I'll give it a try anyway. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> Your bow's useless without the arrows. <laughs> I'm trying to use this very thin tool to widen the notch. I'm going to make some uh, adhesive here to affix the arrowhead in place. The first thing I've got is some charcoal. I'm going to grind it up nice and fine. And now I've got the resin here that we collected. Close to the fire. It can warm up. It's beginning to melt really nicely. And what I do now is start to mix that carefully in with the charcoal. And the charcoal strengthens the resin. Without the charcoal, the resin, when it hardens, is very brittle. It's almost like glass, actually. It cools off very quickly. That's just the first fixing. What I need now is to bind that arrowhead in place and then apply some more glue. So I've got a really firm fixing. Now our ancestors could have used a lot of different fibres for this purpose. But one of the things we know they did from the archaeological record, one of the fibres they used was this. The fibres from a stinging nettle. And that's what I'm going to use. That's the point fixed, now for the fletchings. These are the leg tendons from a red deer. They can be turned into fine fibres, which I'm going to use to attach the fletchings on the arrows. But to produce these sinew fibres, I first have to pound them. Sinew fibres? contain their own natural glue. Now I'm going to carry out a bit of an experiment. In Africa I've seen the Hadza use the bulb of a plant. And they chew it up and spit it onto the arrow shaft as a glue. And I've also come across references in Britain to bluebell bulbs having been used to make a similar glue. Now, these are poisonous, so I wouldn't recommend you do what I'm doing, but I'm going to chew a couple of these bulbs up and spit them on here and see if they act as a glue. I've got a good hunch that they will. Very sticky. Very much like what I've seen the hads are using. It's really quite surprisingly sticky. Right, let's see how we go on. The first one down on there. Pull that good and tight. Another bit of sinew for binding. Fiddly old business, this. Let me stick those in place. And at the top there. Definitely works. That's amazing. Feathers are, are magical things, you know. Amongst a lot of native people, they had tremendous significance because they go higher in the world than, re than most of us are able to therefore came closer to God than the rest of us. And um, 
when it comes to jobs like this, the, the, the magic of their physical structure, which enables you to separate the veins like this, and then gently brush them back together, and they, they connect and hook onto each other again, is just fantastic. All we need now is the bow. Okay, yeah, it is just a little bit stiff there, Ray. Can you yeah. feel the stiffness in the middle of the bow? This is at the crucial stage of the bow making now. Someone once described a bow as a stick that was nine tenths broken. All the magic is in that last little bit that you leave there. And as he pulls the bow, it needs to flex equally in all places on either side. If one area is weak or stiff, the load isn't evenly distributed, and that will tend to lead to the bow breaking. Oh yeah. Well Chris, the thing that bothers me is that we've got a lot of stress involved, and we've got no sapwood. Yeah. There is a very good chance, isn't there, that this could break. After all, the one we saw in the museum was, was broken. Broken, yep, I know. It's an experiment, and we've said this right from the offset. I've you know, been prepared to give it a go, the same as you. Let's just hope that it hangs together. Hopefully they did get some use out of the bow before it broke. Let's be positive. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Right then, Chris, what's the target? Clump of ferns down there. All right, you're on. Good shot. Lovely. She's yeah. hard and fast, yeah. that does. That's brilliant. I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get dinner with it, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> well, of course, that's what it meant. That's what it meant to the original maker. This wasn't a thing for recreation or, or no. a toy. This was a thing to stop the hungry child from crying. Yeah. It really is a forerunner of the longbow of the medieval period, isn't it? It's just yeah. Just a, a few thousand years later, our whole nation stood behind these pieces of you. And relied on that very weapon. This is Shapwick Heath in Somerset. Ashgut Heath, where the original of this bow was found, is just across the marsh there. It's a fantastic environment to come to though. You don't often see a wetland habitat as rich as this one in Britain. There are lots of sedges, rushes, fantastic ferns here. But the real significance is that it's exactly this type of habitat that our ancestors would have used this bow to hunt through. It's now illegal to bow hunt in Britain, but we can still explore with the eyes of a hunter. The forest edge gives you the advantage of preying on woodland animals coming to drink and waterfowl in the reeds. Richard wild horse and boar remains were common as well as great crested grebe and teal ducks, but above all, they hunted deer. Away from the trees, their prey were exposed and vulnerable to ambush from the bank, or from hunters in dugout canoes lurking on the water. With canoes and skin boats, Stone Age Britons could use the rivers as natural passageways through the dense forest, or venture further afield along the coast. Aboriginal Britons were nomads, following the deer as they migrated through the landscape and living off seasonal foods along the way. The deer lived in loose herds, moving to the higher ground in summer. Mm -hmm. 
our ancestors would have been expert trackers, versed in every detail of their prey's behaviour, just as I've seen among hunter-gatherer peoples in other parts of the world today. One of the most profound things I've encountered amongst tribal peoples is their respect for the animals that they hunt. These things are treated with the greatest reverence. They really believe that they are brothers, they're cousins, with which we share our life, our time here on the planet Earth. And uh, that's something I also feel deep inside. Some cultures believe that if you don't treat the animal with respect, then you have no luck as a hunter. This roe deer was shot as part of a cull. And for our ancestors, a carcass like this was a precious prize. The antlers up here, an incredibly important resource. These made needles, harpoon points, tools, the eye. The juice from the eyeball can be used as a glue. The bones themselves could be used. And the skin, vitally important to make bedding, to make clothing, bags and ropes. The old flint tool does a beautiful job. It's just like a little razor blade. Fantastic tool for the task. Beautiful. You see how once you're in there and you at work you only really need to use your hand for this job. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to show you here the leg. Skin that back. This white line here is not bone. That's the tendon. It's an incredibly tough material. And these could be dried and then pounded to separate into the individual fibres, the sinews that are used as sewing material for sewing together clothing or any other job where you need a fine, strong thread. It's really fascinating, you know, when we use these fibres, we're using the very strings, the very mechanisms that give the deer its agility. And that's why they're so strong. That's a beautiful piece of meat. That's going to cook absolutely deliciously. Fantastic. One of the problems that our Aboriginal ancestors had was that they didn't have a cooking pot for their joints of meat because they didn't have clay pots or metal ones at that period. They had to use their fire. Now to make an oven, what I've been doing here is I've been burning a fire for about an hour and a half into a hole in the ground which I've lined with flat rocks so that the rocks will become very hot and I'm going to cook the meat in there. First job now is to open this pit up there's a lot of heat comes out because the rocks are now white hot. This is that beautiful joint of venison. I'm going to put that straight on top of the hot rocks like that. I'm going to move these now on top and around. There's a nice big flat one there. You can see the meat shrinking away from them. This sort of cooking, you've got to have the right sort of ground. You would never want to do this on peat because you could set the ground itself alight. Now I'm only cooking one leg here. You could cook a whole deer this way, and I quite often do that, but uh, even a big feast of many animals could be cooked in this manner. What I'm going to do now is just going to put a lid on top and put these sticks across here 
green sticks so they won't burn. You can already smell the meat beginning to cook. Beautiful. So now, I'm going to cover it with moss. Push that all down. Now I'm going to cover the whole thing with sand. There we go. Well, the sand makes an airtight seal. One hind leg of roe deer rocks as hot as that. About two and a half hours, I'd say, in our measure of time. And while that's cooking, I think we'll have a Stone Age seafood starter. If you like seafood, there's no reason to starve on this shoreline, far from it. Just a few minutes collecting and you've got plenty of food. I remember being up in Alaska with Alaskan Indians and they have a saying there that when the tide is out, the table is set. And that's how it must have been for our ancestors too. It's no wonder that those early communities clung to coastlines. There we go. Get your limpet removing tools here. Perfect, absolutely perfect. <laughs> to cook the limpet, I can encourage them to clamp down onto this flat rock. Like that. Flatten out the sand. And I take these, got a couple of razor clams there. Beautiful mussels up here, some really large ones. Put a few cockles in now. And I'll put the other razor fish there like that. Put this rock in there, I'll set it down at the same height. And now with the hot ashes, straight across the top of there. It'll only take a few minutes to cook like this. I have to say I'm really partial to this sort of Aboriginal cooking. Very simple. Minimum of food handling. Food cooked very hot, very quickly after it's been gathered. It's a very healthy way to cook. And now I can just carefully remove the ashes. Oh, there we can see the limpets now. Beautifully done. Be very careful now because shellfish really, the shells really hold the heat. And there's our limpet beautifully cooked. Let me just clean him off and pull off the black bubble on top. Just pull all that off. There. And we eat that orange meat. It's chewy but it's really good flavour. <laughs> Fantastic. That razor clam there, that's all he's done. I don't know why we don't eat more of these in Britain. The French sell them, even in Paris you can buy these. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, that is fantastic. Mm. Mm. That cockle looks like he's just about done. Oh, that is definitely my favourite sea seafood. Fantastic. That really tastes of the ocean. Wonderful. And what I'm doing here cooking like this. This is a scene that repeated itself around the coast of Britain for millennia. We know that because when our ancestors had cooked this way, had these meals here, perhaps as big families, they took the shells and they literally threw them over their shoulder. And they did that for so long that huge heaps of these shells built up, billions of shells from meals eaten over thousands of years. Some of the biggest of those, those midden mounds as we call them, are found up here on the west coast of Scotland. I think it's fascinating. And in 
those mounds you also find other things. You find deer bones, wild boar bones, um, even the remains of seals, giving you some idea of the diversity of their diet. I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe it's time to start a new midden mound. <laughs> Once I start to get down to the moss, I'll start to roll it back carefully. A lot of heat in there. <laughs> Be careful not to burn yourself. Oh, the smell. If you could only smell this. You can see how the sticks have cooked. There's the meat. That looks beautifully cooked. Oh, if you could smell this, fabulous. <laughs> There we go, and a piece of flint, and we can do a little bit of crafty carving. Now, on this occasion, my sound recordist, Andy, has insisted that he is to taste some. So, we will oblige. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Andy. Always master of the understatement. It's so tender when you cook meat this way. Unbelievable. <clears throat> Bushcraft never wastes a resource. From the fire used to heat the rock oven came embers to bake my shellfish and with this ever useful horse's hoof fungus, I can now carry that fire with me. If you're living a nomadic lifestyle, it's a top labor saving device. from archaeological evidence that our ancestors made very good use of rocky outcrops and caves all over the country. They are ideal places to find shelter and also from protection against wild animals. Even in this little cave, which doesn't look very good to sleep in, there have been stone tools found. So there was evidence that people were here and these rocks once rang to the voices of our earliest ancestors. Using the fungus ember is a very quick way to light a fire. They can smolder for several hours. So a large fungus could be your prehistoric fire lighter for a day's trek. Hunting and gathering is a highly practical lifestyle, and even artifacts which hint at their spiritual culture involve some clever bushcraft. At Star Car in Yorkshire, a set of what are believed to be headdresses were found, 20 of them, made from the craniums and antlers, although they're truncated, from red deer. And these materials are not brittle. A lot of people think this is a brittle material. It's anything but. 
So it's interesting to see how it was broken because there is a little knack that makes it possible. What I'm trying to do is to just scorch the antler. Where I scorch it, it will become brittle and it's much more easy to break. I'm drilling one of two holes which were found at this end of the piece and what they suggest is that this may have been fastened in some way as a headdress. Having taken the antlers off it becomes a lot lighter. Now what was that used for? We can only guess. But I think that there are two possibilities. One, these antlers could have been used in some means as a camouflage for somebody trying to approach close to deer and mimic their behavior to entice them closer or um, I think perhaps more more likely these were used as some sort of mask or adornment for dancing perhaps some sort of religious practice I think they were used by people who were trying to summon up the power the masculine energy of the red deer that they saw around them so that they could imbue themselves with its prowess. To believe that the essence of an animal can be captured in a mask and worn can still be seen in many native societies. But our ancestors also represented animals in another way which for me is their most powerful legacy of all. At sites all around the world, we find fantastic rock art. European prehistory is no exception. Imagine a space that brought these paintings together, images dating back 17,000 years, and their subjects are so acutely observed, they are remarkable. The first cave art in Britain was discovered in 2003. Simple engraved outlines depicting a mature stag. Not yet the spectacular galleries known from the continent, but perhaps there's more waiting to be found. Archaeologists have been able to piece together the techniques and implements employed by studying this art and by doing comparisons and experimental archaeology, as well as finding some of the implements in the caves themselves. And this is some of the range of materials that we used. Um, the paint, the pigment, was very often um, mineral pigments like this, which is red ochre. And this can be used like a pencil or ground up to create a paint on a grinding surface like that and a grinding stone. For brushes they could have used horse hair tied onto the end of a stick like that, just like a modern brush. To fill in larger areas, they had another technique, and for that I'm going to use a bit of buckskin, and in that I'm going to put some of this sphagnum moss, which is wet. I'm just going to wrap that up and then tie it in place with this strip of leather. And what I end up with is this sponge, and I can put pigment on here and use that to fill in larger areas on the painting. Can you tell what it is yet?
there, but yellow. Okay. And trying to indicate the light colour of the underside of the, the deer. It's really quite tricky to do this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly aware of just how clumsy my efforts are compared to those of the original, original artists who were incredibly talented. One of the things that I think is true to say about their art is that whenever you look at it, you can tell that the artist knew intimately the muscle structure of the animal. They've probably butchered them hundreds of times. They knew them intimately and they convey not just the the, the notion of the, this is what the animal looks like, they convey its very spirit, its soul of the animal leaps from the rock to your eye. I think that the, the fact that these were done in the dark with some sort of torch light is fascinating because when you actually move the light around, it really does flicker and move. You can see movement in the animal. That makes it easier to look for the, the three-dimensional representation here. Fantastic. It's really exciting. I could get quite addicted to this, I have to say. Spitting like that, I guess, was an early form of airbrush. What's fascinating is these symbols seem to grab the human attention. Wherever you see them, people stop and they stare. I've seen these in Australia on, on rock art. And in some of the communities in Australia, people can still remember whose handprints they were. And um, sometimes there will be the handprint of a girl who became somebody's grandmother and then passed passed away and people can still remember them with tears in their eyes when they look and see these handprints on the wall. Whenever I see rock art I think about the people who left it there and I'm aware that they were employing a very clever knowledge of nature that made their very life possible, a knowledge that I call bushcraft. In this series we're going to explore that subject, a subject from our past that I believe has a tremendous role to play in our own futures.